This is video 98 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video, we'll introduce the topic of holonomy. Holonomy is the effect that is observed when we parallel transport a vector around a closed loop on a surface. Let's see what happens when we parallel transport this vector from one point to another on a spherical surface. Well, we're going to parallel transport along this line of longitude right here to the equator and then over to this second point right here. So uh, this line of longitude is a geodesic, and that means that since the vector is tangent up here, it will remain tangent all the way on this segment as it's transported down this line of longitude. Eventually, it winds up pointing straight down right here. All right, now it's at right angles to the equator. And as we transport along that line, which is also a geodesic, it will remain at right angles all the way over to the second point. So it's going to continue to point in this downward direction all the way over to our target point right here. OK, well, let's do it again. And this time, let's choose a different path. Let's go down this line of longitude and over the equator this way. Well, it starts out being at right angles to this path. And because this is also a geodesic, it will remain at right angles. So the vector will be orthogonal at this point all the way down to the equator, which means it winds up being tangent to the equator here. And as we transport to the left over to our reference point, then it winds up being tangent to the equator right over here. OK, well, let's do it one more time. And this time, let's just go down this uh, line of longitude right here. This is another geodesic. So since this vector forms a 45 degree angle with this path, it will remain at a 45 degree angle all the way down the transport here, here, and eventually winds up at a 45 degree angle to our reference point right down here. OK, well, what's going on here? What we observe is that um, although we know that the final vector is the same length, the same magnitude as the one we started with, we find that it's pointed in three different directions depending on the path we choose to parallel transport it. Now, you know if we did something like this on a plane that uh, this would remain fixed and would point in the same direction no matter what path we chose. But for a curved surface, it turns out, that that is not the case. So um, the question is, which one of these is the correct answer? Well, they're all correct. It's just a matter of which path we choose to use for the parallel transport. There is no unique or absolute way to do a parallel transport from one point to another on a curved surface. The orientation of the resulting vector is going to depend on which path we choose to do the transport. Now, what that means is that on a curved surface, it is not possible to do a comparison of one vector with another in a different location. That's something that we can only do if the surface is flat. So you're very familiar with doing that kind of a process on a plane, but it doesn't work on a curved surface. We simply have to live with the fact that the direction of the vector at the final point is dependent on the path. Now, what that means is, as a corollary, that we cannot establish what we would call a constant vector field on a curved surface, because there's no way to compare one vector with another at a different point, And therefore, we cannot synchronize the vectors throughout the vector field. All right, well, let's do it again. Only this time, let's parallel transport our vector all the way around a closed loop. We're going to start here, and we're going to transport down this line of longitude. And of course, as before, it's going to be tangent to this line all the way down to the equator, and will eventually point straight down. And then as we transport along the equator, it's going to be orthogonal here and here and all the way across till we get to this point over here. And now we'll transport back up this line of longitude and it remains tangent to this line all the way back. And of course, that means that it's going to be tangent right here. Now, you know, if we did this sort of thing on a plane, that this vector would come right back to where it started. 
But this time, as it arrives back at our point of origin here, we know we have a vector that's the same length as what we started with, but it has rotated through an angle. So uh, it has swung in a different direction by that angle. And we'll call this angle phi. Now the fact that our vector rotates through an angle like this on a curved surface is an effect known as holonomy. Now, as it turns out, it's possible to quantify this effect by means of a very remarkable theorem known as the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. What this theorem says is that this angle, this uh, angle phi right here, is equal to this physical integral, which involves the curvature of the surface times the area element integrated over the entire physical domain. Now, the physical domain is defined as the area that is bordered by the path that we use to complete this entire loop. Now, um, proving this theorem is beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here, but we can at least illustrate how it works. So in this case, our angle phi is going to be equal to this physical integral. And for a sphere, the curvature is constant. It's equal to 1 over a squared. So we can take that out of the integral since it's a constant. So this is equal to 1 over a squared times the integral of dA over the entire physical domain. OK, well, we know that the area of a sphere is 4 pi a squared. And um, the physical domain in this case is 1 eighth of the entire sphere. We could duplicate this area three more times in the northern hemisphere and four times in the southern hemisphere. So the area here is just 1 eighth of the entire area of the sphere. So we multiply that by 1 eighth. And when we simplify that out, you know, a squared cancels out. When we simplify it out, we get pi over 2. And of course, pi over 2 is exactly what we see here. The angle is exactly 90 degrees, and uh, that uh, is given to us by the application of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. All right, well, let's do another example. It's just uh, slightly more complicated. This time, we're going to apply the Gauss-Bonnet theorem to the configuration we used for the demo in the previous video. You'll remember there that we have this circle that's embedded in a spherical surface, and we have a vector t that we're going to transport around the circle. And as we do, because the circle is actually turning left, our vector begins to turn to the right, and uh, continues to turn right as it makes its way all the way around, and would come back um, perhaps to the origin at an angle something like this. All right, well, let's see how the Gauss-Bonnet theorem plays out in this case. Our angle phi here is going to be equal to this integral. And of course, dealing in two dimensions, it's going to be a double integral. And uh, as before, the curvature of a, the surface of a sphere is just 1 over a squared. It's a constant. But then to evaluate the double integral, we need the volume element, square root of s, times ds1 ds2, of course, with the appropriate limits over here. Well, um, for the surface of a sphere, curvature again is 1 over a squared. But the square root of s, if you look back, is a squared sine theta. And then ds1 is d theta, ds2 is d phi. And what we're going to do is to evaluate uh, the integral from, uh, you know, to cover this surface area up here. First of all, the limits for phi are 0 to 2 pi. We're going to go all the way around the circle. And then the value of theta is going to vary from 0 down to this point which is the value of theta. OK, well, um, because of the relationship here, we can represent this integral this way. We can bring this factor all the way across the first integral because it's not dependent on theta in any way. So d phi from 0 to 2 pi. 
and then the second integral from 0 to theta of course the a squared cancel out and this is sine theta d theta so this is what we've got to evaluate here okay so let's do it uh, first of all the integral of the f the first case here is just phi limits of 0 to 2 pi and then the integral of the second portion is negative cosine theta limits of 0 to theta all right well um, applying the limits to the first term just gives us 2 pi and applying the limits to the second case, first of all, we'd have negative cosine theta for the upper limit plus the cosine of 0, which, of course, is just 1. So after applying the limits, we have 1 minus the cosine of theta. And uh, if we remember that we said omega is equal to cosine of theta, then this is equal to 2 pi times 1 minus omega or 2 pi minus 2 pi omega all right well we're interested in the smallest angle up here you know there are two angles there's this one and there's one on the other side so we want the smallest angle so let's apply the um, um, trig identity for the sum of two angles so we can say this, the cosine of our angle phi is equal to the cosine of this difference of angles. We'll just apply the sum of angles formula here. And that would be the cosine of 2 pi times the cosine of 2 pi omega plus... You know, the sign's different in this formula, so be plus the sine of 2 pi times the sine of 2 pi omega. Now, the cosine of 2 pi is just equal to 1, and the sine of 2 pi is equal to 0. So the whole thing plays out to look like this. The only remaining term is this one, cosine 2 pi omega. So the cosine of phi is equal to the cosine of 2 pi omega, which means that our final result is equal to just this angle, 2 pi times omega, which is the cosine of theta. All right, well, let's see if we can verify this result. You'll recall in the previous video we derived an expression for a vector t, and it's this. We said that vector t is a function of phi. We also said that when phi is equal to zero, that the vector evaluates to this. It's simply a unit vector pointing in the y hat direction. Well, when uh, phi is equal to 2 pi, cosine of phi is equal to 1. The sine of phi is equal to 0, so it would be 0 here, and the cosine of phi is 1 there. So um, when phi is equal to 2 pi, our vector evaluates to this expression. So now let's find the dot product between these two vectors. The dot product of t evaluated at 0, dotted with t evaluated at 2 pi. Okay, well, since uh, this vector has only a y component, y hat component, then the dot product is simply going to be the product of this component times this one, 1 times this value. So this dot product is simply the cosine of 2 pi omega. And because these two vectors are both unit vectors, then that means that the angle between them because this is the cosine of the angle between them, the angle between them is simply this value right here, which, of course, is exactly the same result that we have right there. Now, as interesting and obviously useful as this theorem is, it gets even more interesting when we choose to integrate over the entire closed surface. 
When we do integrate over the entire surface, the result generalizes to this expression. What this says is that the integral is going to be equal to 4 pi times 1 minus the genus of the surface. The genus of the surface is simply the number of holes in the surface. For example, for a sphere, the genus of G is equal to 0 because there are no holes in it. For a torus, the value of G would be equal to 1 because there's a single hole. It's a donut. Now, all this is true irrespective of the shape of the surface itself. We can stretch this out or twist it or we can squish it in any way we want to as long as we don't tear it in any place or punch any holes in it. Then the integral here for such a surface that's bounded without any holes will always be 4 pi regardless of its shape. It's also true that it'll be equal to 0 for a torus because the genus is 1. And that would mean if we perform this integration for a surface like a coffee cup, then that will also be equal to zero. So I'll leave it to you as a matter of exercises to demonstrate to yourself that if we perform this integral over the entire surface of the sphere, the value is equal to 4 pi. And then if you do it for a torus, you'll find that the value is equal to zero. Well, as remarkable as this is, I think it's even more remarkable that this theorem was proven by Gauss in the year 1827. That's 33 years before the American Civil War. Okay, with that, let's bring the video to a close with a brief review. What we did in this video was to introduce the topic of holonomy. We showed graphically that when we take a vector in a curved surface and parallel transport it around a closed loop like this, that the resulting vector turns out to be rotated through an angle of phi relative to the original direction of the vector. Now you know that if we did this in a flat surface that there would be no rotation, that the resulting vector would lie on top of the one we started with. But what we showed graphically is that that is a special case that is true only for a flat surface. If the surface is curved, there will be a rotation as a result of this transport. We then went on to show that this effect can be quantified by means of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Now, the Gauss-Bonnet theorem is a physical integral. It tells us that the angle of rotation right here, that's this angle, is going to be equal to the evaluation of this physical integral. Now, the physical integral involves this scalar function, which is the curvature of the surface. And then we have our incremental surface area element right here and we integrate over the entire physical domain. Well, the physical domain is just the area that is enclosed by the loop over here. We showed that if we perform this function, and carry out the evaluation, we'll get the correct answer for the rotation in radians. And finally, we noted a very interesting feature of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. If our surface is a closed surface and we choose to perform this evaluation over the entire closed surface, the result is going to be equal to this expression. Now, G in this expression is the genus of the surface. It's just the number of holes in the surface. For example, for a spherical surface, G is equal to zero because there are no holes in it. For a torus or something like a coffee cup or a donut, there's one hole in the surface, so the genus is equal to one. So the remarkable thing is that uh, this result will always turn out to be equal to this expression no matter what the shape of the surface, no matter how it's twisted or it's uh, stretched or it's flattened in any position. As long as the surface is continuous, isn't torn, and isn't creased in any way, then this uh, result will always be the same.